we're going to talk about how we look at the brain in people who are suspected of having a brain tumor. And of course, the level of suspicion will determine to some degree the timing and the type of test. In the old days, we were very limited. We could do an x-ray of the skull looking for a shift of the pineal gland, which is a small calcification right in the center of the skull. And if the pineal were shifted to one side, then we knew that the tumor was on the other side, and vice versa. And uh, we had angiography, which was a way to look at the blood vessels of the brain. And, and by determining where those blood vessels were deformed or, or draped or abnormal, we could get a kind of an idea about where the tumor is. And all that changed in the late 60s, early 70s, when CT scanning became available. And CT scanning at that time was about as sophisticated as a handheld computer would be today. But it was so much better than anything we had had to work with for time immemorial before. Shortly after CT scanning, which looks at the density of the brain, in other words, the, the, the structures which are more dense look white on a CT scan, the structures which are less dense, like fat or fluid, look black on a CT scan. But shortly after that, we had the opportunity to use MRI scanner, magnetic resonance imaging, MRI. And this is a very, very good way to look at the soft tissues. And it looks at the water content of the soft tissues. And by enhancing the study, injecting a dye called gadolinium, we can get a very, very good impression, not only of normal tissue, but of abnormal tissue, its location, its relationship to normal tissue, the associated effects such as fluid on the brain or hydrocephalus, fluid within the tissue or edema. So the MR scan today would be considered the gold standard for brain tumors. It's not the only study that can be performed or even should be performed, but it is the best starting place. And that's why today we are seeing so many patients with what we call incidental tumors or tumors that weren't even suspected clinically, but they showed up on the MR scan. And then, of course, the question is what to do about them. And that's a very challenging area of neurosurgery and, and also of medical ethics. At any rate, MR scan is performed in a kind of a donut, in a tube, and the open scans are, are a little bit more free. The closed scans are fairly claustrophobic, and about 10% of people will need to have some sort of sedation just to tolerate the scan because they're kind of in this closed space, which is likened to, to being in a coffin. Uh, it's not really that bad, but, but it, it is closed and, and people sometimes need sedation. At any rate, the, the molecules of the brain, the water molecules of the brain are lined up by magnetic fields and then zapped with a, a radio frequency current. So they spin down to their resting state and in spinning down, they give off energy and the energy is picked up by the sensors throughout the entire periphery and then complex uh, calculations are performed, and at the end of the day, we have a picture of the brain. We have a picture of the brain in this direction, which is called the axial direction, and this direction, which is called the coronal direction, and then right in this direction, which is called the sagittal direction. And then these can be further manipulated to create 3D images or to rotate the images in certain ways. It, it's a very sophisticated tool which gives us a very, very good picture of what's going on. Then depending on the type of lesion or tumor, we may look to other types of scanning to confirm or deny the presence of blood, the presence of uh, calcifications, the, the metabolic activity of the brain in the tumor and surrounding the tumor, the location of the tumor vis-a-vis -vis functional areas. That's called functional MR. And that's used when the lesion is in an area which may control speech. So that the MR scan is done with certain other computer protocols with certain different types of chemicals. And we can determine by asking the patient to speak or to read or to write during the scan exactly where those functional areas of the brain are vis-a-vis -vis the bad areas, the tumor areas. Magnetic spectroscopy is another type of MR scan, which shows us the chemical 
balance within the tumor itself. And the chemical balance in the tumor is usually different, especially in malignant tumors. It's different from the normal surrounding brain. So if we have kind of an abnormal area, we can, on the basis of MR spectroscopy, get some appreciation of whether indeed this is tumor or this is scar tissue or this is low-grade tumor or something else. PET scanning or PET scanning, positron emission tomography of the brain, has also been used, especially in recent years and especially in people who have tumors elsewhere in the body. So if we're looking through a big area like the whole body, we can do a PET scan and, and find something in the brain. Or if there's some question whether the abnormality we saw on the MR scan of the brain is really a tumor or maybe just scar tissue, we can sometimes do a PET scan and that like MR spectroscopy, will help to differentiate between the two. At the end of the day, for most tumors, the best diagnostic treatment is to take a piece of the tumor and look at it under the microscope and analyze its DNA. And that's the best way to, to identify exactly what it is. And hopefully, by identifying exactly what it is, be able to plot a course of action, whether that be chemotherapy or radiation therapy or uh, genetic manipulation therapy or all of the above. And that's where we are with imaging of the brain. The imaging of the brain is a radiographic descriptive term. We also have physiologic tests that can be done to look at different areas of the brain. So if the tumor is located in or around any of the visual pathways from the eyeball all the way back to the occipital lobe, we will do a visual field examination, which plots out the visual fields of each eye and enables us to identify where in that visual pathway the lesion really is. Similarly, if we've got a tumor or a lesion along the brain stem or along the nerve to hearing or the nerve to facial movement or the nerve to the facial sensation and we do brain stem evoked testing and if we have a tumor lower in the brain stem which may affect the sensation coming up from the body we do somatosensory evoked potential testing these tests are also useful in that they can be used during surgery to enhance the safety of the surgery and the efficacy of the surgery so we have physiological ways to look at the brain we have anatomical or radiographic ways to look at the brain. And between the two, we get quite a, a good picture of what's going on and what we can do about it, all the way from the uh, few cell level to the zillion of cell level. Not really zillion, but billion.